Hello, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails Common Ground. Uh, I'm Malvika Jolly, Special Projects Associate here at the Rail. And today I have the pleasure and privilege of welcoming our friends at Q Art Foundation for taking us behind the scenes of their organization for a special sneak peek. We're joined today by Executive Director Karina Larkin, board members Ted Berger and Lily Wei, and artists Kambui Olojimi and Miyata Kawinzi, who will also be closing uh, us out in style with a poem. Finally, we've started out all of our events here with two important acknowledgements. The first is that here in New York, we're on Lenapahoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Kanarsi, Munsi, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and the Shinnecock Indian Nation. The second is an acknowledgement that Black Lives Matter. And it's worth saying that the heart of both of these acknowledgements is a commitment to the liberation of the oppressed and solidarity with all who struggle for freedom. Uh, in that spirit, I encourage you all to check out the chat where I'll drop in a moment a living document of resources and actions we've been putting together. Uh, but we'll get right into it. Now it's my honor to welcome our wonderful guests for this lunchtime conversation. Uh, first up is visual artist and writer Karina Larkin, who is the executive director of the Q Foundation, before which she was the managing editor right here at The Rail. She's joined by board members Ted Berger and Lily Wei. Ted Berger, uh, Executive Director Emeritus of the New York Foundation for the Arts, one of our favorite organizations. Uh, he has helped create many national and local initiatives in the arts, many of which I'm sure you will recognize, perhaps we'll hear about shortly. Uh, and New York-based independent curator, writer, journalist, and critic Lily Wei focuses on global contemporary art and emerging artists with an eye on the international. Joining them are artists and friends Kambui Olujimi and Miyata Kawinzi. Kambui was raised in bed right here in Brooklyn, uh, and his work challenges established modes of thinking that commonly function as inevitabilities. Uh, his art practice moves through sculpture, installation, photography, text, video, and as you'll see, the art of the conversation. He's joined today by the phenomenal Kenyan, Li Liberian, American artist, writer, and educator Miata Kawinzi, whose work explores hybridity, the African diaspora, and the reimagining of self, culture, and identity. Uh, and last but not least, keeping them in conversation and in questions, Anne C. Collins is a regular contributor to our art scene section. She holds an MFA in art criticism and writing from SVA, and her work has appeared in Degree Critical and in Variables West. Her film credits include Joan Didion, The Center Will Not Hold, Can You Bring It, Bill T. Jones, and D-Man in the Waters, and the Netflix series The Pharmacist, and her film work has screened at Sundance, Berlin, and New York City Film Festivals. Uh, tuning in, I believe, from Brooklyn, and take it away. Hi. So it's really nice to have um, so many people from Q gathered here today. Um, we, the Brooklyn Rail, did a piece uh, earlier this year uh, that took a di deep dive into Q's history and the way Q works and the community that Q serves. And so it's nice to be in conversation uh, with everyone. And I'm just going to start by asking Karina. Larkin, um, Q's executive director, to give us a general sense. There's so many things going on at Q all the time and sort of your year is packed with shows and um, panels and information. Uh, what's the general overall sort of landscape of Q? What are the, what are the how would you describe the foundation? Sure. Um, first, I wanna, um, thank Fong and the rail staff for organizing this today. It's really a lovely opportunity to, to get together virtually and talk about Q. Uh, and secondly, I want to also welcome Gregory Aminoff, who is actually one of the founding members of Q and who's online here today, Gregory. So you're gonna, uh, if you wanna correct us or um, jump in at any time, please do Gregory. Um, it's good to see you upstate. <laughs> Um, so uh, maybe the, uh, the best way for me to start is just to talk about um, really briefly, like if I had to describe Q's like, motivating values, I, and I think Gregory would agree with me that one of the most fundamental things is art, the idea of artists helping artists and artists uh, driving the curatorial process. And that is something that you know, started, uh, like was one of the, the motivating um, factor ideas behind the foundation of Q and has continued to you know, fundamentally inform what we do today. Um, so that um, artists are helping artists, uh, no single curatorial or artistic vision, 
and also a commitment to the underrepresented um, and emerging. And I think, you know, over time, the word underrepresented has taken on greater weight for our society as whole. And I think, you know, um, for the first, um, you know, maybe 15 years of Q's existence, our, it was implicit in our mission that we were helping um, minor, you know, people of color, people of, uh, you know, LGBTQIA, uh, older people, women over 50. That, and now I think, given what's happening in our society, um, you know, in the past couple of years, Q is starting to become much more explicit about it uh, in terms of defining what does it mean to be underrepresented and, um, trying to, you know, I think we've always done a really good job thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And like I said, it's been implicit in our mission. And now we're just, um, you know, re-examining that, trying to make our commitment more explicit. So, you know, the way that uh, we try to act on these values is three, but through three different types of programs. The first is our exhibition program. Uh, we do six uh, solo exhibitions a year and one group show. And those shows are selected by two methods. The first is something that we've done right from Q's founding, which is an artist nominates another artist. And that of course is because, you know, based on the belief, which I think, you know, Gre was, um, you know, Gregory had a lot of input on this, uh, the idea that artists know who's not getting the recognition and who's deserving of a spotlight. Um, and so, the, um, we choose three shows a year that way. And we also do an open call uh, to, for, to choose solo artists and that allows a more democratic process. It allows us to reach people who are you know, geographically not in New York um, and it allows to, uh, us to balance our program so that um, it is you know, from year to year a diverse group of artists. And we also include in that one uh, an open call for one emerging curator who does a group show. And the criteria for the group show is that, you know, more than 50% of the artists have to meet uh, Q's criteria for under-recognized, uh, under-represented. Uh, and th the criteria are pretty uh, simple. You have to uh, have, you know, evidence of a consistent art practice for more than three years outside of an academic setting. You cannot have commercial gallery representation and you cannot have had a solo show in New York City in the past five years. Uh, and so, um, you know, that um, helps us focus, but is not too rigid in terms of exhibitions. So uh, the second program that we have is something that started out is called Meeting Artist Needs. And it's basically, uh, you know, one-off programs or small series of workshops. Uh, initially, it started as professional development. Uh, art handling, how to prepare your taxes, how to write a grant, all the things that you don't learn in art school. And now we find that um, art, we've also trying to add a lot of um, more like, topical conversations about uh, topics that are relevant to artists. Um, so we, you know, we may have something on uh, a series of artists talking about their activism, whether it's environmental acti activism or political activism or, um, you know, things responding to the pandemic, but basically giving, you know, just giving the opportunity to artists to come together around an issue, discuss it, learn, uh, connect with people who are interested in these same issues. Um, and that's, you know, reflects, you know, our per perception of Q as a hub for artists to connect with other artists. Uh, and then the third program is the Arts Education, which is Q Teen Collective. And uh, it's a small group of people, students from underserved New York high schools, which is basically, you know, 90% of New York high schools have really bad, art, a weak art programming. Um, and um, so it's part professional development. We introduce the students to uh, uh, professionals in all different types, uh, areas of the art, art world and um, show them that there are lots of ways to make a career and you don't have to be a quote unquote starving artist. Uh, and then we give them studio time, we give them workshops to develop studio skills and new skills in the studio and they brainstorm a, a group show topic and learn uh, how to mount a group show and they uh, exhibit at Q at the end of the school year. So they get, they go through the whole process of, um, of, you know, making artwork and putting on a group show and understanding all the different roles that are, you know, that people play to make a show successful from, it's not just the curator, it's, it's, you know, PR and art handling and, um, 
everything, you know, everything else. So, um, and that's, you know, kind of my, like, I think of this, the Q Teen Collective is my sleeper program because it's kind of quiet and there's arts education, there's, you know, there's a lot of arts education, but I think Q's Teen Collective is really special because it does have this combination of studio skills and professional development. But more importantly, I think for the long term is that we are serving underrepresented students that are primarily students of color and we're creating a pipeline for a more diverse, um, you know, visual arts community in the future. And so it's, um, you know, it's an investment we're making now that hopefully will pay off over the years. And certainly one of the things that I was really impressed with when I spoke with Amanda, who runs the arts program, is that um, the, the idea of introducing students, high school students, to uh, people working in the art community, um, that, um, you know, uh, the idea of disbanding the myth of if you want to be an artist, you're going to starve, which um, not every high school student can go home to their parents and say, I'm going to be an artist because, you know, a lot of families want their children to, you know, prosper in this. Yeah, I mean, especially uh, we have a really large percentage of first generation students, um, you know, who, who are in the program and it's really helpful for them to be able to tell their parents who have, you know, sacrificed so much to get here that they can, you know, make a living. Right, right. And just the idea of other careers in the arts, art handling or uh, art writing or art history, art curating. Arts administration, yeah. absolutely, yeah. Right, right, that that's part of the program, that they're not, they, that in addition to the studio work they're doing, they're also meeting uh, professionals, um, you know, in the art field, in, in other, you know, in related uh, career paths in the art field, which I think is wonderful. Um, can you uh, just, uh, in terms of your exhibitions, go over the difference between the um, the three solo shows, the open call shows, and the um, you know, and the group show, which is a which is a curator, the different processes that go into um, planning those shows? Sure, sure. So, so um, just as a side, what you're looking at now is the old queue, the first. Uh, Q that when we started in 2003, uh, which is on 511 West 25th Street. And um, so uh, we work with an advisory council, our board and friends of Q, and we, uh, we identify a handful of artists that will also serve as good mentors. And so we ask three artists, three, uh, we call them curator mentors, we ask them to uh, nominate uh, an artist that they think is, you know, worthy of this of recognition and, um, you know, at the right point in their career to uh, to really take advantage of this exhibition. And so, uh, for example, in September, our next show coming up uh, is we asked Odili Donald Odita to curate a show, and he nominated an artist named James Morell, who is based in Philadelphia and who is trained as a master plumber and uh, became an artist and now teaches at UPenn. And, uh, you know, he is, uh, his work is really um, layered, complex, very like thrilling to see <laughs> and really innovative. And so that's, that's a really good example that shows opening in September. Uh, and so we do that with three shows a year. And then the open call runs uh, annually. We open it in February. It's usually open till mid-April. And uh, you, we work through, you know, the website submittable. Artists have to submit an application and an exhibition plan. And uh, last year we got more than 850 applications. So it's, uh, we narrow that down to, to uh, three solo shows and one group show. And uh, as you can imagine, that's really challenging to do. We um, make sure that every per every application is read by three people and we uh, ask a panel of curators and artists to serve as the, to, to you know, to make the final selection. And those uh, artists and curators then go on to be the mentor for each exhibiting artist. So, uh, and then the group show is also an open call that happens the same time as the uh, solo exhibition open call and um, exhibiting curator, uh, cu young curators or emerging curators will uh, make a proposal and that will be selected by the panel. And again, that curator will have a mentor and put the group show together. And then the final show of the year or, or every spring, the, your um, educational. Uh, and then the last show is the QT collective show. Right, right, is the QT collective show. Yeah. Great, great. Well, um, 
I know that um, Ted and Lily are here and that Gregory is here. I just wanted to sort of step back in time a little bit and talk about uh, Q's origins. Um, and I don't know of the three of you who would like to jump in with that, but I know I had a really nice chat with Gregory uh, earlier this year about um, what was going on in New York, you know, in the months following 9-11 uh, when the market kind of bottomed out and people were wondering about the future and, you know, not roaming galleries as they did. Um, uh, and the idea of, of uh, Q kind of coming in to fill a certain void at that time. Do any of you want to talk about Q's history and uh, early formation? Well, um, while I'm probably the Methuselah um, within the group, I really wasn't there at Q's origins. Um, Gregory was there at the at almost at the very beginning. I came in that next stage. So, Gregory, I don't know if you want to. Well, I don't want to. I'm just a visitor here. I'm not, just a visitor. I'm, okay. But Gregory, I'll, I'll be brief. I, I think I overspoke to Anne when we talked on the phone anyway, or babbled on. In, in simple terms, we had an opportunity from several benefactors to open up a space in Chelsea where they were looking at real estate. And that was a short phone call. And then a year and a half later, I received a call saying, we're looking at real estate. And I, I dropped my paintbrush or whatever I had in my hand because I didn't even, I had forgotten all about the conversation. So we had a chance in, in simple terms, as I've said many times, to open up a, a, a free open space in the belly of the beast, in the belly of what was becoming the most commercial part of the art world. Yet we were serving music, poetry, visual arts, serving artists of all sorts and setting up these programs, some of which were set up later by Karina and later on. But that was, that was the origin and the benefactors were incredibly generous in funding and building out this beautiful space. So it was kind of a shock to have a nonprofit have such an elegant space, but I think it served the artists. So I wasn't embarrassed by it. I was a fan of it because you have artists coming from all over the world, all over the country, and actually all over the hemisphere, coming into a space that was as beautiful and as lavish and, and, and compelling and such a beautiful frame for this artwork. But that's, that's the origins. And then it developed into we had speakers, we had music, we had uh, all the things that that Karina has and Ted have uh, enumerated. That's all I'll say. That's enough of a beginning and probably too much. Not a bit. Um, it's always a pleasure to chat with you, Gregory. Um, but I just wanted to sort of say, you had said to me that the original motivation behind Q was to save artists and to kind of create a sea change in their careers. Um, so the idea of a, you know, gallery, you know, street level gallery um, that was a beautiful space was very important, um, you know, was, was you know, that the space itself was able to give an artist a boost and that the entire process of being selected for a show was able to give an artist a boost. Um, you know, you weren't showing in the, the back room of, you know, somebody's apartment, you were actually in this gorgeous gallery, as you say, in the belly of the beast in the middle of Chelsea and that uh, the show was lit and it was hung and that there was, uh, you know, a catalog that went with it, um, that for some of the artists uh, that were chosen, this was, this was indeed a sea change. Um, can you talk about maybe some of the early artists uh, that you felt, you know, this really impacted greatly? Are there any particular anecdotes um, where you felt like a show was, was really clearly changing somebody's life? Who, who are you asking? Any, again? You can you can go, Gregory. Anybody? Well, well I'm I just, trying to remember Elizabeth Hartney, uh, a you know prominent writer and critic who's participated in Q for many years. And understand, I haven't been there for six years, but she chose a gentleman, and I cannot remember his name. And maybe Karina remembers. Barry Monroe. Yeah, he was from Kentucky. I think he was doing roofing. Okay. Oh, That's it was Eleanor. Eleanor Hartney. Eleanor yeah. Hartney was the curator. I can't yeah. remember the name of the artist, uh, but he was a roofer and struggling and that's the hardest job you can do. And he was not a young man. He was in his probably middle, late forties. And he, we, Eleanor had seen his work at some regional exhibition and pulled him out of nowhere. And it literally changed his life. I mean, that sea change occurred and he was not only the Q Art Foundation was his work very good, but it also meant that in his locale, 
he was much celebrated. A lot of things happened and there were galleries interested in New York. And that's one example, but there's so many. Josh Dorman, who's doing very well right now, who I believe Paul Oster chose. I can't remember. I believe that's true. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. Many, many artists and probably Corinna. Uh, uh, Malvika, I, I, Gary I Monroe's artwork is slide nine in the presentation, if you want to share that. Uh, Tadeus Mosley was uh, also just recently honored with an artwork, yeah. but Gary, that's Gary's work. And there's Gary. That's Gary. Um, Gary yeah. was working as a roofer and had this incredible art making practice and was living in Tennessee and not showing anywhere. Is that correct? And then had had a full show at Q in, and was sort of brought into New York and put up in a hotel and given a show and an opening and um, a catalog and, you know, had a curator helping him, you know, with his installation and everything. And I believe he went on to do group shows and that he showed elsewhere in New York and, and you know, that this really launched a career. Um, and as you say, Gregory really saved him from, um, you know, roofing is so toxic and so dangerous and, and to have, you know, sort of this um, fairy godparent entity come into your life uh, is wonderful. Who's the other artist, Karina, that you wanted to see another slide from another? Oh, I mean, there's so many, <laughs> but right. like if, we, if we skip forward uh, two slides, Miguel Luz, oh, Ken Gonzalez Day, great artist, but Miguel Luciano, uh, you know, he's um, uh, an artist who is of Puerto Rican descent and he's um, had exhibits at the Museo de Barrio and has been working at the Met. Uh, recently, and if you uh, Marina Adams on slide 15, she's um, doing great. Um, and then uh, there's Marina. Uh, Cecilia Condit, who's the next slide, I believe, um, is a videographer who's based in Wisconsin. And she had a, her kind of 15 minutes of fame because um, TikTok picked up uh, an ex uh, an excerpt of her work and she has uh, she was in the New York Times in the past 18 months having like a, you know a cult following and then I guess our biggest success story is on the next slide Naimo Hyman who is uh, of Bengali uh, descent and uh, had a show in 2009 and two years ago was nominated for the Turner Prize uh, and and Naim also um, has um, is the first uh, Q alumni to come back and curate an artist show. So that was also a, a nice kind of uh, full circle. Come but back I, but I also think that besides the professional opportunities that come after, the, the validation that comes to most artists is perhaps the most critical part of it. Because for me, um, marketplace issues, whether in the profit or not-for-profit world, will come and go in an artist's career. Believing in yourself and saying, I ought to stick with this is critical um, to what Q is all about. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I also think there's a, something to be really said and, and noted about the opportunity to try new things That's or right. you know um maybe it was something that you were doing uh for years but this was the first a scale shift or uh you know a quantity or to just make a work you know wonderful piece you know it was what 50 feet the one that um, oh yeah the the show the Athena Latoka that was in yeah. the picture of the first gallery yeah that was yeah, the Athena's, entire length yeah like you're not you know doing that in your studio every day you know like you need a space to show a work like that and so it's that's something that is transformative oh. and, there you and go. Yeah. Re resonating. Ken Bowie, would you talk to us about your experience and your work? You were uh, nominated by Hank Willis Thomas, right? Yes. Um, yeah, it was great. It was, you know, I, I, I make no, I'm, I'm not shy about saying it's one of the best art experiences I've had working with institutions. I felt like um, it was really clear. It was really um, reliable. I mean, these are even before we get to the sort of impact, just the fact that the, sh the internal structure was such that the communication was clear, the, the dates were reliable, the like 
all the writers that were involved were wonderful and, and respectful. Like those are foundational things <laughs> that I think sometimes get overlooked. And then on top of it, the, you know, Q was flexible in terms of like what I needed for this um, exhibition that was going to be all new work. So um, the funding could be, could be worked in a way that was like based on uh, the needs of an artist. Um, and then the show itself was, um, it was a lot in terms of the making for me, but it gave me a chance to make, you know, what was it, three pieces that were like 15 feet tall. Um, and you, you guys were really, I, I ratchet strapped large pieces of furniture directly to the walls. So I have a soft spot <laughs> for Kambu's show because I, that, um, my first day of work as executive director, they were installing Kambui's show and I didn't know anything about the plan. I just walked in at 10 o'clock that morning and there's a bunch of art handlers trying to lift the furniture onto the wall. And I just thought, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> but it was a beautiful show and yeah, kudos to the Q staff that, that made it happen. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, speaking of writers, Kimbo, you bring up good, a good point that Q, you know, is so comprehensive in everything that they do for a show. Um, Lily, I wanted to ask you about how you found your way to Q and about the Art Writers Mentorship Program that you, uh, you know, spearheaded and continue to oversee. Well, I'm not quite sure I spearheaded it, but uh, I found my way to Q, as I think a lot of people did by invitation. Um, Gregory, you were the I actually, what were you? What was your position? I was the curator governor, and <laughs> you were just you were wonderful. Governor, you were there, but, uh, the curator governor, which I exactly. I like the sound of it. I had no idea what it means. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I was invited to a curator show, and it was a much um, simpler process then, I believe. But you know, like like all of us, we have um, evolved over the time and become, I think, more comprehensive and found things that we, you know, that could be done, that we needed to do, that uh, that we could address. And anyway, I, I just very much enjoyed the experience and they had such a terrific group of people associated with it. And and of course, I, I, I love the fact that it was uh, not commercially oriented because, you know, this is what nonprofits do and you kind of like that directness. And I think I recall reading what you wrote um, Gregory about how well there was only about four or five of you and so when you had an idea it could be done you know and not go through like you know all kinds of levels of um, of bureaucracies and anyway and so it did have that kind of immediacy and also affect that you know and as everyone has said it, it did affect a lot of people but as to the writers I think actually it was Irving's idea uh, Irving Sandler who was a long time right supporter. And um, I remember Irving has always been asking, well, what can critics do? What, what should critics be doing? How can critics stay, you know, up to date? And one of his suggestions, I think, was to kind of have a mentoring program. And this mentoring program is something I think that, you know, had become clearer and clearer as, as um, Q's mission, that what they do is, is mentor, however it's done in including you know, strategies, um, but connections, um, the, the, all kinds of things, as well as enabling the art to be shown. So yeah, so anyway, so this, this writing program um, was actually, I think the, maybe the first coordinator was uh, the late um, Annette Grant from um, the longtime editor at the New York Times for their arts and leisure page. And then Betsy Baker, uh, was in charge for a while and then it came to me and I actually thought I'd just be there for a year but I'm still there. <laughs> <laughs> thank thank and, God for that. And I'm loving it uh, and, and, and of course if this the staff as it has come and gone through the through the years and and this present staff is of course fabulous with Lily um, Hearn Foundation. We always have to kind of distinguish which Lily we're talking about. And um, uh, Joseph, Josie Heston and, and everyone, they've been super terrific. And, and I've taken it, uh, this, you know, the, the mentoring program, the writing to another level. And so the process there at, at this point is, um, uh, there's an open call um, for the, 
the, the writers. And because that seems to be such a democratic way of doing things, I think we're thinking about trying to make it an open call also for um, the, the uh, mentors. But, but now, of course, we're also doing it in, uh, we have a partnership with ICA, the International Association of Art Critics, and um, I've been the liaison there. And oh, also we, we did have a mentorship, I mean, a partnership with um, Art 21. So the writers who did the essay would do um, the essay not only for the Q catalog and site, but then also for a publication at Art 21. So, and I think we, we are also constantly looking for appropriate partnerships. So that going. In any case, the, the writer is usually a young writer. Um, in the past, they've been less experienced, but now I think, writers have had have, have, have more experience and at a younger age. And I had this thought, Karina, when you were talking about the teen, the teen program that I don't know what the catalog looks like, but you know, who says that writers and, and a lot of them are fantastic, you know, at 13, 14, 15, that, you know, that they also could be their own, you know, uh, explainer, explicator, right. interpreter, you know, yeah. that might be interesting. We, also. Um, actually, uh, because I used to work at the rail, I'm kind of classified as a writer. And every year, one of the funnest things I get to do is work with the teens to um, write an artist statement and talk to them about formal analysis and, you know, things they're not going to get in their high school curriculum. And, and uh, it's great because, uh, you know, it's a skill that, um, that all artists need to be able to talk about their work. So anyway, I think this catalog, which is online um, and in print, and I think, you know, it's it's been wonderful. I think it's done, um, it's gotten better and better, or shall we say it's always getting better because of, you know, just new things that come into play. And, um, and so, and the current one, by the way, if anyone, you can look at it online, it's, it's, Beautiful, um, designed by uh, Lily Hood Foundation, and um, it's by uh, Lisiana Cruz, and um, the writer for that is Alex Santana, who is also a curator, and uh, the mentor with uh, Leticia Alvarado, who is uh, a Latinx scholar and teaches at Brown University. So anyway, that's something you can look at. Um, I think for a lot of artists, it has been important for them and for a lot of writers. Um, I don't, I had notes, but, you know, because I wanted to kind of keep myself succinct, <laughs> but I can't see them because we're, not, we're on PowerPoint. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I should just, I, I don't want to miss anything that I really wanted to, to talk about. But, but as I said, you know, there is an open call for the writers. So I hope, you know, people will, um, you know, take it into account. Oh, I did want to mention that there, um, there has been the thought of being, you know, you know peer to peer mentoring as well as, uh, more established mentors. And um, so that's something too, that I think is a, is a bit of change and, and responsive, you know, to the, to our particular moment. And, um, and also just as a, a, perhaps a pragmatic matter, but I think it matters is that you know, we started out like, I think giving an honorarium to the writer, which wasn't much, but we've been able to add to that, which and certainly not commensurate with what we would like to do, but we are a small nonprofit. But nonetheless, we're trying to, you know, to get it um, to, uh, yeah, to a good, you know, to a good place. And but the mentors were perhaps asked to do it as a kind of professional courtesy, and now we, you know, that has changed, and at least they are getting something because they take a lot of trouble doing this, and we appreciate the help. So. I, I'm sure I missed tons of things, but but anyway, that's an overview. Well, I'll just say that the uh, all of the Q uh, catalogs from the beginning, from the very first shows, are available are viewable on Q's website. So you can always go on to Q's website to look at past shows and to read the catalogs and to read the essays, the wonderful catalog essays that have been written over the years um, for each of them. Ted, I wanted to ask you about how you found your way to Q and also what you think it is that sets that sets Q apart from other foundations, because you have experience in other foundations and there are some wonderful organizations around the city and, um, you know, in the country. But what's special about Q and what drew you to the Well, Q? what drew me to Q, I, as some people may know, I had been at the New York Foundation for the Arts as its director for nearly 35 years. I started there when it was a two person operation and then it kind of grew over the years. And um, 
I was about to retire and uh, the then executive director, uh, Jeremy Adams uh, um, came in to talk to me about Q and where it was going. Um, I, I knew Jeremy and I knew Q from a collegial sense. I didn't know it as intimately as I've grown to know it. Um, what, and, I, and I think what happened was that the, the founders began to say, we need some other people to sit around the table. And um, they, or perhaps Gregory um, knew, knew more about me than um, uh, others did. And well, I- To interrupt, we were looking for a legend. <laughs> I, I, I don't I'm know about kidding. that. I'm not I kidding. I found one. But what drew me to it was um, some of the some of the basic values and principles were which were part of its DNA from from the founding, um, which which was it was artist centered. Mm -hmm. It was. Um, committed to inclusion without really having thought it through and defined it. And that it was open to new ways of looking at things. Um, in my years in, in the field, I, I think I'm going close to the 50th year in this not-for-profit circus. Um, I began to, and I still do, appreciate the critical role that incubator organizations have in the, in the evolution of an artist's career and an artist's commitment to doing the work. And I had been on many boards and many committees, but had never actually been on the board of an organization that was an exhibiting organization and was um, really trying to figure this stuff out, okay? Moreover, Q had a, an atypical developmental tra trajectory. As, as Gregory des described from at the beginning, Q started out, was jump-started by its founders um, in a way that many other not-for-profit organizations aspire to years later, okay? And while it, while it was jump-started that way and it allowed a lot of extraordinary things to happen, it really hadn't yet thought through how was this going to survive over the long term? And if one is committed to uh, how living artists can make a living, um, then um, one is, has to be committed to what the role of incubator organizations like you would be. So I found that really challenging and it's been <laughs> challenging ever since. Um, and it will always be cha uh, uh, challenging. Because the difference, I mean, there are a lot of organizations have used the term foundation um, in its title, but that doesn't mean it sits on an endowment. Um, and so, like many other organizations, including NIFA, um, Q has to raise money in order to give the money to artists and to uh, raise programs. And it's had to diversify its funding base. When Q started, it didn't receive any public money and it didn't receive any private funds, other, other private funds other than from the founders. So, that's been the challenge over these years, like anybody else in the field. Right, right. Um, and speaking of um, 
Q's uh, determination to give uh, artists an incubation period, I'd love to ask Miata and Kambui again to speak about their shows. Miata, if you want to start, because we haven't heard from you yet, about this idea of being an emerging artist who um, needs sort of a boost, but also, you know, an incubation, a, a way of trying something new in a bigger space. Um, what was your, how did, how were you brought into Q and what was your experience? Yeah, of course. And just thanks again to Q for everything and Brooklyn Rail for hosting us today and inviting me to be part of this. Um, and so, yeah, I actually um, applied through the open call for a solo exhibition and this show that I had soft is strong um, was up from April to May of this year so it feels very recent and fresh um, and I'm still kind of like understanding you know how it is boosting um, my practice um, but I will say that you know I Actually, um, there's a video that's at the heart of this exhibition called She Gather Me. And I wrote like in my visioning for this piece, I'm gonna apply to Q to show it there. And I don't even know if I like told anyone this, but when I applied for um, the open call and then, you know, I think the pandemic had kind of just started. We were a couple months in and I found out that I, receives this opportunity. And it was really such a beautiful moment on so many levels, like to be able to really expand my work and think bigger to have, you know, resources to do that on multiple levels from the financial support to, you know, like curatorial support, working with Ronnie Quevedo, who is an artist that I've long admired. Um, the, you know, all of the sort of support from Lily and Josie and Karina and everyone at Q, um, it really helped me sort of, you know, bring a big project to fruition during a time when a lot of opportunities were getting canceled or postponed. Um, you know, there was this, and there kind of always is, but like magnified sense of precarity. And so it was like very grounding as well. Um, and, you know, I'm an artist that works a lot with experimentation and time-based media and ephemeral things. And so it's not always the most commercial work. Um, and so to feel like, oh, this is getting validated, you know, I'm getting, you know, these opportunities and the support to continue this and sort of expand on it. Um, and so that was very important as well. Um, and, yeah, I mean, Kumbu was talking about being able to sort of think bigger. Like I was like, okay, I want to create my first wallpaper. It was like 20 feet long. You know, what you see on the screen now is um, a detail of that. Um, but, you know, being able to sort of try things out for the first time and get support with that. And also as an artist that works with installation, um, you know, people are often a little hesitant to do things that are too much. Um, I don't know, like some spaces don't really want you to like alter the space at all, which I didn't do at Q, but I was like, I want to do the Mylar floor. Like, <laughs> can we figure it out? And for folks to be like, yeah, let's figure it out figure it out you know that's so um a friend our floor was beautiful i just could not move from those rocking chairs <laughs> thank you i think there's a slide but maybe we can see what that looks like there we go yeah so you can yeah. see gallery that these rocking chairs are on this glass like mylar floor with the video projection on the wall so you were saying, Miata, that Q was allowing you to do things that another space maybe would not have given you the freedom to do. Right, exactly. To get that vote of confidence was really um, special. And even like through the installation process, you know, I, um, I still feel like I'm emerging in a lot of ways. And so, you know, I, this was the first time that I got, you know, this kind of installation assistance that like, I'm not the only one troubleshooting or in the last minute trying to, you know, get everything down that there's really like a team of support. Um, and so I just, yeah, I mean, there's so many ways in which the experience has really sort of allowed me to reach a new 
um, even understanding of like what I can do, um, which is so important. And especially during the pandemic, I have to say again, you know, that this still continued and that we were still able to um, sort of stick with the vision just feels really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kambui, you're a little bit further um, away from your show at Q. Um, Miata's show was just up this spring. Can you speak about how, you know, over time, um, having that show kind of changed, uh, you know, your ideas about what you can do or, you know, what was wonderful about having a show at Q that maybe you haven't been able to do elsewhere? Um, I'm interested in the idea of, um, this idea that keeps coming up of Q being a place for work that isn't, you know, commercial work. What exactly do we mean by that? What what is this kind of openness that Q allows that you might not have in another space? And how does that kind of change you as you're moving forward? And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Um, I think in in terms of the relationship to market, I think it's you know like the market can find a way to sell whatever it needs to sell. Like it's sort of a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. So that's something that like, I, I, I'll probably stay away from. Cause for me, the, my experience there was sort of moored by <clears throat> the idea of community. So I'd been making work for some time <clears throat> and it was a chance for people who maybe could not make it out to bed you know, uh, when bed was a very different place, um, that were in Chelsea all the time, could come by, could come from museums, could just pop over. It, it was one, the location set it in a geographic community that um, allowed relationships that I already had to be in, those visits were easy, you know? So the show was up and I did visits. I mean, Karina, I, I was there like every day. It was literally because every, people were like, oh, I'm down the street, can I come by? Oh, I'm down the street, I can come by. And we would talk and I think to me, that's the, that was part of the, that resonance that I was able to sit down with a curator and have lunch in the show and like talk about ideas and they show up early. I think um, also the peer-to-peer, -peer, like uh, me and Hank have known each other for a very long time. And this was an opportunity to have conversations kind of not even like the show was moving like this and we could have all of these conversations parallel to it that went back to, you know, back in time a decade and we're like, oh yeah, I think this, not for this show, but this in two years. So. Um, there was some work that was in the show at the time my guardian angel had passed. She was, her name was uh, Catherine Arline. She was a pillar of the Bedside community. She helped form me as an artist and as an individual. And at the time my, my, my show was called Soul Nostalgia and it's about a psychic dislocation, essentially being homesick when you're still at home. And so I was saying that her death the police violence and the rampant gentrification of New York had really made me feel like this wasn't my home and that I was being hunted um, as a black man in the city that birthed me. Um, so that, that conversation, um, part of it was coming to grips with both grief and the shifting of the city in relationship to Catherine Arline, I think I showed nine small uh, 1114 paintings at that show. I worked on that for five years and I recently showed at uh, Project for Empty Space in Newark, New Jersey, over 200, you know, that, that project now is over 200 works, 200 portraits. And so um, again, going back to the idea of community, the conversations that I started there, I had those conversations for five years with different people, you know, and the peer to peer, Jessica Lynn and, you know, uh, Kat Calder and, you know, and Karina, it's like being able to 
to continue and continually develop these ideas, I think is my biggest takeaway that in the catalog, because in 10 years, someone's like, oh yeah, I was thinking about this idea, you know, and they never will, more people will see the catalog than can see the show. Right, yeah. right, right. And the catalogs are so important, as you said, uh, for, you know, especially for emerging or underrepresented artists to have something that it's online. I, most of the catalogs are also available if you go in to the Q gallery space um, to just have this sort of document and this, um, you know, written work about your about your show that that you know is something that you can carry with you when the show is down again, right? Yeah. And, and share me, internationally. I'm oh, sorry. No, I just wanted to say that the catalog was day one. That was part of the package, you know, right. an honorarium, a catalog, fly the people in, put them up, help put up the show. And that was, that was day one, that was necessary for the exact reason that Ken Bowie mentioned. Yeah, and um, we continue to get really positive feedback about the catalog. And um, during the pandemic, we started doing short video uh, documentation of the shows as well, uh, so that people who couldn't come into the gallery uh, could see it. And that's um, turning into, you know, we're, we're gonna try to continue to do that because it's, it's a nice kind of um, addition or counterpart to um, the catalog to have the, the artist speaking about the work and being able to, you know, like, uh, you know, kind of be in the space virtually for a little while. Right. But we're, you know, we're very committed to that, giving the opportunity for the artist to, you know, archive their work and to be able to have a lasting record of, you know, what they were working on at that moment. Right. And to have the engagement of a writer and a mentor on, you know, for that writer Absolutely. and the engagement, you know, your mentor has a statement if it's, if it's a chosen show as, as Kambui's was, but there's also a, an art writer writing, you know, really thinking about engaging with the work and amplifying what's going on in the show. And, you know, that's, that is, a, you know, this wonderful permanent record that, uh, you know, can be looked at by people who maybe didn't see the show and, you know, carries the show into the future in such a wonderful way. Absolutely. Karina, is there anything else that kind of uh, you had to um, pivot to during um, during COVID restrictions that uh, you think are that you found, you know, to be beneficial that you're going to keep, you know, in addition to the artist videos? Is there anything else that, um, you know, this time that we may or may not be coming out of brought to Q's operations that, uh, that you think will last? Uh, well, you know, Aside from the fact that, you know, I'd just like to, again, acknowledge what an amazing job the staff did in terms of closing down the gallery. And then when we reopened in September, uh, we were able to, um, you know, shift the exhibition schedule so that we met our commitments to every to every artist. And so no shows were canceled. And that was our primary concern. Um, and, you know, the staff did like Lily and Josie, Lily Hearn Foundation and Josie Heston, the programming staff, um, did an amazing job um, migrating uh, our public programming online. And uh, you know, I'm sure a lot of organizations have experienced this is that um, you know, Zoom enabled us to reach a wider audience. So we were you know, suddenly getting 100, 150 people uh, showing up for programs. And we, you know, we did something with a, like a, a, a multi-part series uh, with Camille Janan Rashid, that was, which was called Night School. And uh, you know, we had people all over the country logging in. And that was really exciting to be able to reach people, um, you know, a, a bigger audience. And so we're gonna try to continue that, uh, you know, as I'm sure a lot of other organizations are. But, you know, we've been fortunate that we own our own space and that we were able to reorganize the schedule so that everybody can, um, you know, have the show that they were promised. And, you know, now I think it's about, for Q, kind of looking forward, it's thinking about how to, you know, build on, you know, the values that we've established and, you know, double down on our commitment and make our, um, you know, make our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion more explicit and try to impact more artists' lives. Right. Um, is there anything before we go to Q&A that anyone from Q would like to add that we haven't touched on, Ted? I, I just want to uh, point out something that Corinna just said that we own our own space. One of the important things that happened because of the founders was that while the 
space that we had in the belly of the beast um, on 25th Street was beautiful. It was also bleeding us dry as an organization. And we began, I guess the conversation started after I joined the board. We had to really, in, in order to stabilize the organization, we really needed to deal with our space needs. Um, and, um, and there was a great effort. And finally, an, an anonymous donor was found that allowed us to uh, purchase this space in, in a condominium. And while it may not seem as uh, beautiful or even as luxurious as, as, the, as we originally had, in many ways, it means that Q can continue um, to do the work that it's meant to do. Um, and, and while owning space has its own liabilities, um, nevertheless, it gives us something that is secure to build on. And we have other ideas for what we can do with the space, but it's really been critical to the development, the institutional development of, of Q. I just wanted to say, I think the space is, is beautiful. I've been to both spaces and I think that that this, you know, I mean, I'll speak from, for me, I'll speak for other artists when I, I speak for their love for this space and I'll speak for me more emphatically. The new space is kind of fire. I like that it's, it's right. designed so that you come in and then it has the upswept, the high ceilings in the exactly. back. You don't see it coming. Right. It's an interesting yeah. space. And, yeah. it, you know, it's a, you, as someone who works in installation, being it's an opportunity to have a space that's not just like a big white box. Right. So, I mean, that's, I just wanted to share that real quick. Thanks, Cam Bowie. We needed that. <laughs> yes. It is a beautiful space. It's a beautiful space filled with incredible energy, no matter what the show is. Every show has its own specific energy, and it is a wonderful, wonderful space, um, probably because of everything that goes into putting those shows together and, and bringing them together. Um, yeah, anything else from our Q team while we have you here that you want to say? If not, I'll ask Malvika to um, to uh, switch us to Q and A. But can I could I just say how important these small these small um, nonprofit art organizations that support artists directly um, they should be valued and they should be supported and and helped so um because we you know we don't have the kind of nor is it our our intent to have that kind of of you know huge budgets that large organizations have but this is like grassroots it's direct it's a direct infusion into the community it feeds directly so um i would just like to say that briefly. If, if, if 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 this pandemic didn't teach us a lot yeah one of the things that crises always do. It talks about the fragility in our own lives and in the so-called ecosystem that we have in the arts and cultural community. The vulnerability of the very group of organizations that Lily has just said is so important to this field that it's almost taken for granted. It cannot be for granted. And within that, the further vulnerability is with the people who make it happen. It, 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 it is the staff um, and the artists who, whose lives are so vulnerable economically that we've got to do something to stabilize the whole system. And that's the next work that has to be done to really make this field grow significantly. Yeah, because they work so hard and actually- you know, Underpaid, and even, you know. inadequate fringe benefits, all of the above. Exactly. I think perhaps that's a beautiful place, um, a beautiful and vital place to transition to a Q and A from, from the people in the room. Uh, does that feel all right to everyone? 
All right, let's go ahead. Um, I also wanted to thank you all so much, uh, Ted. I love everything you said about sort of the commitment to the archives, the question of the li living legacy of the work. Uh, Kambui, what you said about like the reality that you know mo more people will see the work in the catalog than in person, um, and you know, I guess like how much more this is brought to scale, uh, as you said, Miata in this precarious time. Um, you know, it's, it's just been like a very interesting year. It's been very interesting to see the turns that you have made. And I feel like it's very much like everything you've been saying has been so in line with the kind of grand project we've been doing here at The Rail since March of last year, uh, trying to create kind of a living document of our times. Uh, so thank you all so much for coming in and really like throwing open the doors. And uh, I know I've learned so much. Uh, so our very first question will come from our very own friend, Lynn Crawford. And Lynn, you should be able to turn on your microphone now. Hi. It's actually a bit of a comment and maybe a question, but um, in 2000, I'm a Detroit-based uh, novelist, but I write some art reviews. In 2010, I was asked to curate a show at Q, and I chose the wonderful uh, John Corbin, who was then living in New York. And that show was fantastic, and it got a review by Raphael Rubinstein in Art in America. And, um, and it was just, as someone in Detroit at that time, before a lot of before Detroit got more um, involved in the global conversation, it just felt really great to be plugged into something. And then after that, and again, I'm not sure how this happened, but I was on an advisory panel and I'd written for the Brooklyn Rail, but that was the first time I ever met Fong in person. So it was also a way for someone not based in New York to meet people um, living and working there. And uh, I just really appreciated that. And I think a lot of people in Detroit did too, so. I, I'll just say something real quick. One of the big challenges in the early days was to try to be geographically diverse. It was a challenge because everybody knew a lot of the artists that we asked to curate, we chose the choosers, okay? So the choosers, we tried to try to find choosers that, that also had legs in places like Detroit or Omaha or Houston or Santa Fe, and we were successful there, Mexico, Canada, but that was always a challenge. So I'm, it's really mm -hmm. nice to hear. That was hard to do because of because just being in New York with 10,000 artists, you know, all of whom live in Brooklyn, apparently. And you were on that panel with me and Fong. Yes, I was. And that was, so I get to meet you too. So it was, it was great. I mean, it was putting, a, it, it was nice to actually be in that setting. So I appreciated it. It was also a challenge for the writers to write the catalog because yeah. the idea was that they had to be in person, you know, so they had to be in the area. And sometimes that wasn't as easy because most of many of you know our lists or the people we knew were sort of on the coast. So, you know, that was another way. Now, of course, we can do it much more easily. And, and the open call helps to do that kind of thing too. So mm -hmm. thank you for bringing it up. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lynn. Uh, our next question is crowdsourced from a number of people's questions. Uh, this is sort of for Miata and Kambui. Uh, one part of this question is asking, the people wanna know, what was the most unexpected benefit or thing that came out of your collaboration with Q? Uh, something unanticipated, something maybe you learned or were surprised by. Um, and then, you know, we're also broadly more interested in you know, hearing more about what the process and the thinking was behind your two exhibitions. Uh, they're both so visually striking and kind of uh, gestural, requiring kind of an engagement with the body as they move through the space. Um, and, you know, we'd love to hear a little bit more about uh, the thinking behind the exhibition and what brought you to it. Big questions. I'll um, jump in. So thank you for asking about those aspects of it. Um, I'm trying to think of like what the most surprising thing was, um, because there are a lot of surprises, <laughs> which, you know, kept it interesting. Um, but I think actually that, um, I don't know if I mentioned before, just kind of the process of working with the writer for the essay, um, who is a young artist curator named Adiolo, Adiola Olakitan, who just graduated from SVA, their program in curatorial practice. 
and um, like me is a queer African. Um, and that was like very special to me to be able to work with someone in the art world that shared that identity. Um, and I will say as well that, you know, a lot of, I spend a lot of time, like not only making work, but having to contextualize it, having to explain a lot of things, having to, you know, sort of um, usually do a lot of different aspects around how the work is understood. And that can be taxing um, and just draining in a way. And so being able to work with Adiola, um, having you know a series of conversations because another thing about the process is that it's so long term you know which for me has been rare that it's really this long term engagement and sort of unpacking and dialogue around the work um and so you know within that process i feel like those conversations really helps me understand the work better um, from someone who understood cultural references and things of that nature, which like in grad school, that wasn't always the case, for instance. Um, and so I really appreciated that. And um, also working with Ronnie Guevedo, the curator mentor, because um, I know that sometimes the curator mentor is coming from more of a curatorial background, but for, in my case, um, he's an artist. <laughs> But it was really helpful in the sense that, um, for instance, he works a lot with space, with floors, and, you know, he also, um, from a different perspective, thinks a lot about cultural hybridity and cultural dualities, which is something that my show was looking at a lot. And so I think just being able to have these other voices, and, you know, we did, I think all of our meetings were virtual until, like, right before the show opened. Um, but in that time of isolation as well, being able to sort of still, you know, have that stimulation of these um, theoretical mm -hmm. conversations that would really help being shaped the exhibition. Um, and so, yeah. <laughs> I love that so much, um, like the voices in the room. And Kambui, I'd love to throw that to you next. Um, thank you. Uh... I think for me, some of the, the surprises came out of um, an openness, to be honest. You know, uh, I'd worked with different institutions and to varying de degrees. And one of the things is you just don't know how open because you also don't know what kind of load an institution is carrying. So, you know, some an artist, some they could not be open to tr transforming the space, or um, you know, have a really tight deadline. You just don't know. Um, for me, my show was everything was going to be new. I really wanted to <laughs> go at it hard, and I was like, I'm just going to make all new work. So the conversations I was having was about things that didn't exist. And that in and of itself is a leap of faith. And then once I started talking about how it's like, yeah, there are these like, you know, handmade glass, you know, sculptures that are underneath these massive pieces of furniture that float above them. And, you know, it could have gone, those conversations could have gone a lot of different ways. And I felt like everyone at Q was super open um, and embracing and, and therefore, uh, there for the ride. Like we're gonna. I didn't. I didn't ever feel like I needed to convince them that it was gonna work out, and that then lets me really focus on how to make it to to invest in the the spaces that are vulnerable to me and that I don't really understand, as opposed to going to the spaces that are knowable in order to then communicate and translate that to someone else who's like, we want to, we want to understand this. Um, and then that there was a partnership, like, um, I think, um, you know, I feel like Karina in particular and Shona at the time, um, really, like I had conversations with them about the work and about um, how to solve some of those problems, and especially writing and text and press that came out of the exhibition, those were all bonus tracks to me, you know? It was just like, oh, oh, I can, you know, I didn't even know, I didn't know 
I mean, it wasn't right until I started reading some. I was like, man, you probably are right. <laughs> you know, like those kinds of discoveries um, were really wonderful. And it was, uh, it was a, a show that for me was, ca was captured by a community. Like I, I keep coming back to this community, but it made points in relationships between me and Hank, even though it was a long lasting relationship that this was like a, a, a benchmark or a, 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 a shining moment. Um, and the writers as well, and the, the staff and, and you know people at Q, um, you know, I don't know how many times I continue to go back. And then also the community. So I have a lot of those catalogs. Like I was in there just like taking catalogs and stacks, like in bricks at them. Just like, like these are free, right? Okay. <laughs> it was like, all right. And I, you but know. But what do you do with them? Well, <laughs> do you look I, at them? I read them. And then also when people are like, oh, you know, do you know any artists da, 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 you know, you have any recommendations? I can't remember last names to save my life, but I'm usually like, oh yeah, uh, you know, this person, this is their name, you know, or I'll go back to the Q website. Um, but th there's a community of artists that they don't know me. Like we never met but I probably recommended them for things. I don't know, some people I know I recommended like four or five times um, and never even met. And so it's a nice way to be introduced to these artists and, and uh, be, you know, not to sound cheesy in a spiritual community with them, as well as, you know, people that I've met who are like, oh yeah, I read this, I was at the queue and I read this and I'm like, when it's like three years later because the catalogs are still there um and yeah so i think it's it's a place to think having artists choose artists is something that's really beautiful because they also they push in a way or you, they have different conversations that, that i think then curators if we're looking at like the the people as their professions not as you know people like artists in general, like, oh, you know, why don't we try this? Why don't we, you know, turn it upside down? Is this, there's more of a, um, a, a spirit of experimentation, play, crash and burn, like, let's just, let's just do it. Um, and so it's nice to be, have your curator, you know, have that. I love that so much. I feel like you just gave Q the best blurb like straight from bonus tracks all the way to like the telephone book of the brick of recommendations. Um, but thank you so much, Kimberly. It's such a beautiful uh, set of sentiments. And, and now I'm going to come by your office and pick up some catalogs of my own. Uh, I know we're kind of pressing against our ending time. Uh, our next question will come from Anya. And then I think we'll go straight to Miata to close us out with a poem. Uh, but Anya, take it away. One moment, let me find her. I know you can unmute. Um, hi, thank you all for uh, this conversation. Uh, this question is for everyone involved with Q. Um, I'm thinking just looking back at the history of Q, uh, I'm curious about what um, are some of uh, the most unconventional or wacky installations that you remember fondly, um, thinking about the install of Kimberly's furniture on the, on the wall and the other scores um, helped me uh, come up with this question. Um, so thank you. Well, for me, Kimberly's was definitely one of the wackiest ones, but <laughs> also one of the most beautiful. Um, Gregory, maybe you can help me remember the guy that drove up from Texas in his car and slept on the doorstep <laughs> of Q. <laughs> I, I've successfully forgotten that. <laughs> and I do remember, I I do remember we, asked, we asked somebody, <laughs> William Beckley, to curate a show. And he curated a young woman named Lucia Love, I believe. And it was a crazy show. He, she dug holes in the wall. And it was very art of era, but the, the members of the board who objected to it didn't know what that was. But I certainly got a lot of shit for that show. It wasn't my fault. 
because I was Twitter's governor. <laughs> it but, was a great show, and she's a great artist. And I, yeah, I thought, it was, the I thought it was the hole in the wall, and it. nobody, nobody's. There's no yeah, evidence. Beautiful ever. space. There were holes in the wall, and it was defiled for sure. <laughs> we drove up uh, in Texas. the three boys, we, the three young men, who, who had that collective from Houston. Yeah, yeah, it was before my time, but it, you know, whenever we've been having drinks and talking about it, uh, talking about you know good shows, that one comes up. And you know, Mo Kong had a great, uh, a great uh, Chinese artist did a, a really fascinating, complex show on um, China, Sino-American relations and uh, globalization. And uh, he didn't mention it to us, but he did have three installations with fruit flies that he was snuck into the gallery. <laughs> there was that. <laughs> so if anybody needs to know how to get rid of fruit flies, it's a, <laughs> an open glass of red wine vinegar. We got, we were, we managed to get rid of the flute flies before the opening, but uh, it, it was an amazing show and, and he's an amazing artist. So, you know, in the grand scheme of things, I can't complain. That, that and, must be what I was drinking. That's why I can't remember. The red wine vinegar. <laughs> yeah. I love that you just get the flies drunk too. Well, it was red <laughs> wine, wine vinegar, cheese. so yeah. yeah. I, don't know, but... I, um, I like I what say... I like what oh. B put in the yeah. the chat, and he used Hughes catalog to get on the plane because he lost his ID. <laughs> <laughs> just, just one quick aside. When, at the beginning, not only were we looking for diversity geographically and culturally and in every gender, you know, in every way we could, but the other one that we used to say more and we don't say it anywhere, I haven't been there in a while, but we said it a lot, we show works that would not necessarily have the opportunity to be shown anywhere else. Problematic work, great political work. And in 2003, there was not a lot of, I mean, that was just the beginning of a lot of work that was problematic and problematic from a commercial point of view. So that was another, that we look for, you know, problematic work, a work that would be rejected by a commercial gallery. And I think Ted spoke to that a little while ago, but I just wanted to strengthen that idea. That was an important thing. Yeah, absolutely. That goes hand in hand with the experimentation. And I don't also, think you guys were part of that, but you know. <laughs> you know, I think of Sean Thornton, who is uh, Tom Burkhart curated his show about four years ago. And Sean is, you know, well known in the artist community because he's the baker at Skowhegan, but he's an incredibly detailed painter and it takes him two years to finish a painting. And so no commercial gallery would ever invest in his career because, you know, because our show at Q had his entire life's work. But, <laughs> um, but you know, to have that opportunity um, to see, for people to see his work and for him to be able to show it was, you know, a really special and something that an organization like you can do. Right, that's a great example of an artist knowing a, another artist who right. is completely deserving of a show and in exactly. need of a show that, exactly. and that no commercial gallery would commit yeah. to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I love that so much also, just thinking about the art that is at, that is completely outside of questions of market and completely outside of like the span and longevity and like time stamp of the market, uh, which is how fantastic. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm going to squeeze in just one last thing, uh, maybe in the last 60 seconds, and this is for everyone on the panel. Uh, I'm wondering what is your biggest or wildest dream for Q uh, in the future or more broadly for sort of the arts nonprofit uh, with which we're all familiar. I'll, I'll say I got two. There's a like a residency slash international residency exchange. And then the other would be like a, um, some kind of lending fund, like a, a way for artists who want to like go in on buying a building or like buying homes or those kinds of things that where if you have capital, you're able to access more capital. I mean, if you have ac access to capital, you're able to do things that give you financial security long-term for one's whole life. So that's another thing that is a wild dream for you right now. You know, uh, Kambu, that's a fantastic idea because I think that New York is facing like a serious challenge 
in terms of sustainability of the arts community and you know um i don't have to explain the real estate market to you but you're right i mean <laughs> it's it's a real challenge to hold the community together because for because of the real estate market yeah if you don't have a space you go away every conversation in new york <laughs> at any dinner party any bar somehow hits on real estate and it's you know it's for q as well because we have uh you know a wonderful space that gives us some stability but you know i you know it's testimony to the staff that the staff knows how to mount really good exhibitions and we know how to connect mentors and i just want to do it you know for for 30 or 40 artists instead of okay. six <laughs> you know so we need more space and and uh to be a, a bigger hub we need a just a, a healthier, more inclusive, more financially stable um, arts and cultural ecosystem. Um, the whole, what I said earlier, the the criticality of incubator organizations, both for artists but also for the public the places where they can first see work that they're not going to see any place, whether in the visual arts or performing arts or, or whatever. It, it's, um, and, and it's, it, it's critical that the field doesn't become ossified. So you have to, even within the, the, um, the, the risk-taking part of it. So there's always got to be a fluidity that allows new ideas to come into it. That's a, that's a difficult thing um, for the puny funds, both public and private, to sustain. And we've got to look very differently at what the, the future is going to be about the health of this community. Lily, I know you were about to say something just a moment ago. What? Oh. I forgot what it was something, um, but what we, what we need is a, what, uh, you know, a, a Melin, M Melissa Scott, a Mackenzie, how why can't I get her name right? You know, <laughs> that grant. Melinda know. French, right? No, uh, Melinda French Mackenzie, or Mackenzie, Bezos. Mackenzie Bezos, yeah. That's yeah. what we need, okay. And, uh, a healthy endowment forever. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Uh, I feel like all conversations come back to the healthy endowment forever. Um, <laughs> thank you all so much, Miata Kambui and Ted Krina. Um, everyone in the audience who's shared their voice today, this has been fantastic. Uh, I feel like so much of what is being discussed kind of has to do with like a plasticity of who we are and like cultural generosity. Um, and this has been like a really uplifting conversation for my internal optimism. So thank you so much for bringing us into your beautiful fold, this conversation. Uh, Fong asked me to share that he's in transit, so sadly unable to share his final thoughts, but he is really sad to be missing it. Um, otherwise, he would tell you so himself. Um, and uh, on his behalf, we'd like to thank you all for uh, making the time to share uh, your organization with us. Uh, as always, we'll share the recording of today's readings on our archives as well as on YouTube, so it'll be available in a day or two if you'd like to revisit this magical space. Uh, but before we close out, I'd love to pass the mic to Miata, who will uh, close us out with a verse or two. Thank you so much. Radical optimism forever. <laughs> so I want to read just a couple of short poems, including the poem called Soft is Strong that I wrote in conjunction with my Q exhibition. Soft is Strong. To reconcile the sky and ground, the body like time unfixed, a clearing, a queering, a shadowed fullness, a black grace. How do you conjure flight? a freedom dream, a witnessing, repair, reparate, respirate. This ballet of enunciation, breakbeat of meaning, boom bap of the tongue, what was static, loosed, become elastic, porous. New cartographies of gaps, 
out of which seeps black light. How we spin jewels from terror, how we spin threads taken apart to be restitched together, what was separate joined. To stretch so taut but never break, this bridge called my back, a ladder called me back. Times weave and weft the heft. Footsteps ascending. The people could fly. The people do fly. The earth heartbeat remixed. A conjured song that soft be strong. And this last second slash last one is called The Things the Water Teaches Us. The value and stillness, the ability to be in one place yet moving, how to slide easily into different forms, harden when we must be solid, soften when we need to fold, how to become fugitive in dispersal, how to gather again, to assemble in a different kind of mass, many slight units becoming dense yet using that weight to nourish. This gift of renewal, spell of shapes and shifting, how it is valuable to exist as multiple, responsive, how to paint with light, a dappled surface gifting the surrounds with magnified warmth, the knowledge that depths hold that a blockage can be swallowed and released, a clench fist covered, anything is capable of being broken down, subsumed, released, the power in accumulation, that power can be yielding. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miata. Um, I love that about accumulation. Um, thank you all so much. Uh, once again, uh, your you know space in this Zoom has been a blessing. Uh, please join us again tomorrow when we sit down with independent writer, curator, and critic Antoine Sargent in conversation with Rail editor at large Paul D. Miller, aka DJ Spooky. Uh, we'll close that out with a poetry reading by Lucia Hinojosa Gaciola. And that will be, as always, at 1 p.m. right here in the Zoom. Uh, other than that, thank you all so much. And I'll invite you to turn on your microphones if you'd like to say hello to one another, uh, goodbye on your way out, or anything else that compels you. Um, this has been fantastic. Miata, thank you for closing us out on fugitivity. Thank you, Q. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Kiara, thank you, everybody. Thank you for having us. Gregory, great so to see awesome. you. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Wonderful Bye. to see you. Great to see you. Bye. Thank you. I hope we can do this in I person. See, eventually. Yeah, I hope to see everyone in person as well. Thank you. Absolutely. Sending love. Thank you. Wow.